A brain locked in, in which is shown that motor outputs and pathways are not necessary for consciousness, nor are they sufficient. God's flaccid will is ruled by a capricious queen. The circus of disease has endless numbers. Whom would he meet in the next room, thought Galileo? A singer with no voice, a poet without a language. A man sporting a large moustache was leaning against a cupboard perforated by elaborate woodwork. No reason to worry about me, Galileo. My gears are spinning tight, he announced. I trust so, replied Galileo, looking around and wondering where Frick had disappeared to. Then he noticed the brass levers that emerged from the middle of the cupboard and a shaft holding a thick roll of paper on the left side. He addressed the man. Could you tell me the purpose of this strange cupboard? Is it an organ? Oh no, said the moustached man. So it does belong in a church. The cupboard contains the automatic confessor. A mechanical confessor? inquired Galileo. If you want to call it so, answered the man. It was built by Father P. His pretext? Pilgrims flock to Rome in such large numbers, he claims. That everyday friars are taken ill under the strain of too much sin they must remit. So Father P came up with this machine and sent it here to be evaluated. His mechanical calculator is remarkable, you know. But the automatic confessor is incomparably more powerful. How does it work? asked Galileo, who was becoming curious. The machine's inner working are a secret, said the man. All I know is that there is a set of gears devoted to its sin. One gearbox for superbia, one for accidia, one for invidia, luxuria, and so on. The sinner enters a written confession with these levers, one for each letter, making sure all the details are spelled out, even those he may find irrelevant. At the end, the sinner signifies the strength of his remorse by how strangely he pulls this red lever on the right. Then the machine parses the confession, grins through its secret gears, evaluates every instance of each sin, rates it, rates it by the intensity of the remorse, and blurts out on that roll of paper the penance one deserves. With such machines, the Father P, all the priest has left to do is pronounce the absolution. Of course, a bell will ring if the machine becomes aware of mortal sin. And has this come to pass? asked Galileo. Certainly not, answered the moustached man. The strength of heresy is so strong that it was smelled in Rome the moment they heard the word of the machine. Leaving the absolution to the priest, they saw at once it just a fig leaf on the abdication of the soul. If one goes along with this machine today, tomorrow some other machine will replace not just the priest but the pope, all the saints and angels, and who knows, even God himself. But if it helps a man who is overworked, I don't see anything wrong with it. After all, it is just a machine. No! answered the moustached man. It is a pagan idol that crunches men's offerings in words. And men are fools. They'll soon believe their idol's answers, even if it understands nothing at all. Because it is one thing, he continued, to count instances of accidia, invidia, avaritia, luxuria, and so on, to calculate the proper penance. It is quite another matter to put each sin in its own context. One gear that zifts through the mud of human life and error can only grind its teeth at gluttony, for instance, but it does not know anything else. Another gear sucks in full sludge, peering for lasciviousness, divides the act and thoughts of men into those that reek of lust and those that don't, but has no idea of what life is if you take lust away. Lust and not lust, that's all it understands. And even within lust, the many forms that lust can take. The sensuousness of a womb-like flower, the enarched, nipple breast of a hill that stretches on the horizon. 
the obscene beauty of a bird's plumage, even the sublime, unearthly beauty, the resplendent majesty of the virgin, can titillate yearnings not of the sacred kind, even the stirring curve of the mother's voice lamenting the dead son can lead to a frenzied ecstasy, the sharpened ticklish imagination of the hermit. I don't understand myself, said Galileo, interrupting brusquely. I was carried away, apologized the man, taking a little drawing from his pocket. This is our little church and cemetery. When I sketched it long ago, it seemed innocent and all. But now it's evident what's wrong with it. He pointed at the hill in the background. But the machine to know what's wrong with this picture would need to see like you and me, not just read, and would have to understand what it sees. The contours of trees and mountains, the shapes of moving clouds, the way that everything relates to everything is in every scene we see. To know of sin the way we do, to uncover it in life, in art, in dreams. It needs to know all that we know, what is, what isn't, and what relates to what and what not. A machine may best a priest in speed and accuracy, will not get tired and not succumb to empathy, but if it cannot see the way the true confessor sees, even behind the dark grill of the confessing booth, it will not understand the sinner, nor the sin. Well, said Galileo, but if it spots the sins better than the priest, on what authority can we say that it understands them less? Beware of judging the act and not their meaning, said the moustached man. A good priest can answer any question about what is an isn't, but a machine, the air. And he entered a string of letters with the levers. How bad a sin is silence, at which he revolved a large wheel alongside the cupboard, and after some cranking the paper roll began to flow. On the paper, written in large red characters, was the machine's answer. The blasphemy is a sin, false witness is a sin. You see, said the moustached man, it does not see a sin if it is one of a mission. The silence of friends, the acts one could have done but did not do, those it cannot judge. I will try a question too, said Galileo, if you don't mind pushing the levers. Tell me, asked Galileo, the ambition to do good, is it wise or virtue? Ambition is a sin, doing good a virtue, rolled out the machine. Is both right and wrong, intervened the moustached man. Let me put it to the test, so he pulled the levers and entered. What is more important, the cause or the effect? The cause is judged by its effect, the machine spewed out. Don't you think that men should worry about effect and cause is the prerogative of God? asked the moustached man. No, said the confessor. You are not responsible for either. See, said the moustached man, this machine could easily fool a lot of people. Most people think that behind the grill there is an old father confessor, one who sees and knows it all. Instead, it's just a forest of gearboxes, each looking for its sin, forgiving of the rest. Like the cerebellum, thought Galileo. Each gearbox, each module in the machine, is good at what it does. It can answer well and fast within its own domain, but cannot see the context. And yet, he said aloud, at times it's hard to judge who is behind the mask. Truer than you think, answered the man. Sometimes it's hard to judge if there is anybody at all. This is why I'm asking for your help, Galileo. Not to divine whether behind the grill is a confessor or rather a machine, but to find out if a soul dwells behind a human face. And he beckoned to Galileo to follow him into the next room. Within the room the air was dark and heavy. Lying on a bed in the far corner was a man breathing slowly through a hole in his throat. The wheeze that waxed and waned was the wheeze of agony. Galileo moved closer and felt the man's pulse. The heart was racing, but nothing else moved, and the man's body remained stiff and silent. Yet his eyes were open, and he did not seem asleep. 
Suddenly, Galileo recognized him. It was his old friend M. Before Galileo could recompose himself, the mustached man spoke in a loud voice. This is why I need your help, Galileo. M is no more with us. And he took the formula with him. As Galileo did not seem to understand, the man hastily explained. He has found the formula. The formula for the prime numbers. I am sure that must be it. Of course, I left for Paris right away. And then, when I arrived, I found this speechless body, as inert as a stone. It has been seven days without a single sound. What's the matter with my friend? asked Galileo. M had an accident to the part of his brain that moves the threads of movements, said the moustached man, pointing to M's head. M breathes. You can hear that. But nothing else moves, except for his right eyelid, which keeps blinking all the time. Some reflex irritation of the eye. Galileo again took M's hand. The pulse was racing faster, but he would not talk. He is alive, thought Galileo, but is he conscious, or, like Copernicus, is he lost in nothingness? How would one know? Then he reflected, what would doctors do to judge whether somebody is conscious? They ask some questions, and if the patient gives a good answer every time, they judge he must be conscious. If there are no answers, they try and make the patient move and look for any sign of purpose, or make threatening gestures and see whether they bring out a response. If they do, perhaps there is somebody there, but M was immobile, and pricking his skin did not produce the slightest movement, except perhaps the blink. The blink! Galileo was losing faith, when it occurred to him, could it be that M was trying to say something with his eye? Could M hear him? He told M to open and close his eyes to answer, once for no and twice for yes, and immediately the eye opened and closed twice. Could M see him? Again, M blinked twice. Did M recognize him? M's eye said yes. The moustached man was taken by feverish excitement. In the blink of an eye, he said with childish glee, he would write down the alphabet, and so he did indeed. He soon began to point to letter after letter, urging M to blink when his finger was under the one he meant to spell. Galileo was anxious to discover if M could feel and taste and smell, even more if he could think and remember. He learned it soon enough. M's mind was functioning, just as it always had, like the well-oiled machine it was. The moustached man, instead, was trying to pull out from M's eye the formula of the primes, but with the symbols of mathematics, the questions were more difficult, and none of them made M blink. Meanwhile, M began to dictate simple words, as if there were no time left. His eye opened and closed so fast the moustached man gave up transcribing, just moved his finger over the letters and left it to Galileo to read M's eye and write all down. Perhaps the formula is coming out in words, letter by letter, he said. Thus Galileo read what he had scribbled. Morior morientis me corporis captivus, cogito en non ago, non ago ergo non sum. For God's sake, M, tell us the formula instead, said the moustached man but M was mute and immobile. Galileo looked at his friend. M was proof of this. One can be completely paralyzed and yet be entirely conscious. I die a prisoner of my own dying body, M had said. I think, but do not act. Don't act, thus don't exist. So he was conscious, all too conscious. Galileo sank into his own thoughts. He thought that those parts of the brain that control speech and movement are not necessary for consciousness. They are like ports through which the intentions and decisions of the mind are manifested. All they do is send these orders to the muscles. Of course, the orders must be accurate, 
since they must specify the differences among the words we speak, among the notes we play. Yet M did not need any of that in order to think, just like the blind painter did not need the nerves leading signals from the eye or the ear in order to see within his mind. Galileo looked at his friend again. Now M was blinking furiously. Spiritus numerus ipse. Then he said, No, write, Galileo, write now, for I have sinned. My God, forgive me, my God. Then slowly his eye said, Indulgi mi domine. Galileo touched M's hand. As when we sleep, he thought, when we lie paralyzed and yet we are conscious of a dream. But his friend was paralyzed inside a nightmare. No gentle prodding could awaken him. Outside a stone. Inside a universe of consciousness. The moustached man came near M, took his other hand and squeezed it. Then slowly he closed his eye. A soul can have its thoughts and yet hide them forever. Unsuspected. Undisclosed, unfathomed and unshared, Galileo thought. But a machine may have no soul and still pass judgment on our sins. One day, perhaps, we will ask not M, but the machine. And perhaps the machine will confess the formula. Then quickly Galileo left the room and passed by the machine. The paper had rolled down to the floor. He took it and read... Go in peace, for I absolve thee. Notes This chapter has two goals. The first is to show that one can be conscious even when one is completely paralyzed like M because of brain lesions or like all of us when we dream. The second goal is to contrast M, who cannot speak or act, but certainly has a soul, or rather had one, with a mere machine the automatic confessor, which never misses a beat but presumably has no soul. It seems that, at times, one ought to be careful before concluding that little response means little consciousness, or conversely, that many clever responses necessarily imply much consciousness. What would Descartes have thought of a modern chess-playing program? The moustached man, for his part, thinks that a machine may be good at producing clever responses but bad at producing consciousness because it is made of separate modules. So while it may occasionally fool us with its answers, it lacks the context and understanding that only consciousness can provide. His suggestion is discussed in Koch and Tononi, Scientific American, 2011. M is Father Marat Marsen, a French monk, a man of science, and friend of Galileo's. Mersenne had tried to find a formula that would represent all prime numbers and had several exchanges on this topic with Pierre de Format. After Mersenne's death, letters in his cell were found from dozens of scholars, including Galileo, Fermat, Huygens and Torricelli. Mersenne thought that the cause of science was the cause of God, and through his immense correspondence he became a hub for European scholars, who often met in his cell. His chief goal was to promote collaboration to advance science, and he asked in his will that his body be used for research. Mersenne became ill after a visit to his friend Descartes. However, there is no indication that in his final days he may have suffered from complete paralysis. It is also irritating that the author inserts Latin quotes, if they are quotes. Yet another Frenchman, Alexandre Dumas, presciently described this condition in the Count of Monte Cristo. The locked-in syndrome, as it is now called, leaves patients completely conscious but capable of communicating only by moving an eye up and down. During dreams, the body is completely paralyzed by brainstem circuits, while consciousness continues. If the paralysis does not occur, some people may find themselves acting out their dreams with dangerous consequences.